Okay, let's uh, talk about the inverse of a matrix. First, let's go back and think about the inverse of just a scalar, a real number A. Um, the multiplicative inverse, as opposed to the additive inverse, uh, of a number A is just 1 over A, assuming A is not equal to 0, because uh, if we multiply A times 1 over A, we get 1, or 1 over A times A equals 1. And 1 is the identity element for multiplication. Um, we can use the same idea for matrices. The inverse of a matrix A exists only under certain conditions. So not every matrix has an inverse, just like not every number has an inverse. Zero doesn't have an inverse. Okay, we're going to write the inverse of A as A with a superscript negative 1. And we have A times A inverse. We would just read this as A inverse equals the identity matrix, okay, this is not the number one, this is the identity matrix, and also A inverse times A is the identity matrix. Okay, one of the requirements for A inverse to exist is that A is a square matrix, okay, and you have to have that so that you can multiply on the left and on the right by the same matrix. Okay, let's start off by talking about finding the uh, inverse of a 2 by 2. Okay, in this case, there happens to be a, a, a specific formula for the inverse. So if we have a 2 by 2 matrix A that looks like this, A, B, C, D, then A inverse exists if A times D minus B times C is not equal to 0. Okay, so that's A times D. So multiply the elements on the main diagonal and subtract off the product of the elements on the uh, off diagonal. So A times D minus B times C. I call it the crisscross applesauce. A times D minus B times C. Alright, so if that's not zero, A inverse exists and here's a formula for it. Notice that we divide by AD minus BC. That's why it has to be non-zero. And then the matrix is uh, formed from A by swapping uh, the A and the numbers in the A and D positions. Okay, so we swap A and D and negate D and C. Okay, so that's how I remember it. And you swap A and D, negate B and C. So for example, here's a matrix A. If we look at uh, the AD minus BC, that's 4 times negative 3, so negative 12 minus negative 9 times 2, that's negative 18, so negative 12 minus negative 18 would be negative 12 plus 18, which is 6, so we're dividing 1 over 6, this thing here is 6, and then we swap the 4 and the negative 3, okay, they swap positions and negate the negative 9 and 2, and uh, then multiply that out, and we get this matrix, okay, so that's the inverse of A, and if you check, multiply A times A inverse, you get the identity matrix. If we multiply A inverse times A, we also get the identity matrix. Okay, let's look at another example. Here's another 2 by 2 uh, matrix. Um, but, uh, oops, in this case, if we multiply, do the AD minus BC, we got 1 times 4 minus 2 times 2, which gives us 0. So that tells us that this matrix does not have an inverse. Um, and if you look uh, at that matrix a little bit, you see that uh, the second column is just two times the first. Okay, those columns are multiples of each other, so they're linearly dependent. If we look at A in reduced echelon form, um, it has a row of all zeros. Right, so we have a free variable. Um, uh, to the point, we say that A is not row equivalent to the identity matrix, okay? And it turns out that if A, any matrix A, if it's not row equivalent to the identity matrix, then it will not be invertible. And if it is row equivalent to the identity matrix, it will be invertible. Okay? Um, we don't have a formula for the inverse of a 3 by 3. Um, so we need to develop a method for computing the inverse or for determining that the inverse does not exist. So what we'd like to do is find a matrix, let's just call it B, 
such that A times B is equal to the identity matrix. Okay, so if we assume that A is N by N, then that means that B also has to be N by N. And we'll uh, denote the columns of B by these uh, column vectors B1, B2, through BN. So, recalling from the previous section, if we multiply A times B, we can write that in this form, A times uh, the matrix, here's B, the columns of B, B1 through BN, and that equals just A times B1 in the first column, A times B2 in the second column, and so forth. So, you remember this, that A times B, um, you get the first column as um, a linear combination of the columns of A using the elements in B1 as the multipliers and so forth for the other columns. So remember we want that to equal the identity matrix. So here's the identity matrix. So we want A times B1 to be the first column of the identity matrix, A times B2 to be the second column, and so forth. So in order to determine uh, the matrix B here, we need to solve N systems of equations. Okay, so if we solve those N systems of equations, we'll have uh, A inverse if it exists. All right, so let's uh, look at this matrix uh, and see if we can uh, follow that method. Um, it's a two by two, so we could just use the, the formula we have, but let's try applying uh, this method that we just discussed. All right, so A times B, A times B1, A times B2, and we want that to equal the identity matrix. So we have these two systems to solve. A times B1 is 1, 0. A times B2 is 0, 1. So here we go. To solve this system, um, set up an augmented matrix, um, do some row operations, and uh, notice that A, you get to this point, see that A is row equivalent to the identity matrix, so that means that A inverse does exist. And here's the first column, B1. Um, is negative one half three half, so that's the first column of the inverse. And uh, to get the second column, we solve this system: a times b two equals zero one, the second column of the identity matrix. And again, I set up my augmented matrix, tack on zero one, do some row operations, um, and uh, notice that the row operations that I'm doing here are exactly the same ones that I did up here. So first multiply row 1 by 1 fourth, same thing down here. Then 9 times row 1 plus row 2, same as down here, and so forth. And that carries through the whole way. And if you give that some thought, um, you'd say, oh yeah, that makes sense because the row operations that I'm doing are based on the entries in A. Uh, right, I'm trying to get A in reduced echelon form. So since A doesn't change, same same A here and up here, um, then it makes sense that the row operations I do don't change. Um, the only thing that's changed is what's in the last column. Okay, and so we end up with this for um, B2. So I've got my two columns of B, which uh, is what uh, the inverse of A is. And um, and yet, if you look at this, you think, well, that seems like to be a lot of repetitive work, and it is. And so um, we have a more efficient method, and that is to solve both systems at one time. Okay, so instead of just tacking on one column uh, in an augmented matrix, we tack on both columns or the whole identity matrix, depending on what size your uh, original matrix is. And here we go through that same sequence of row operations, and we end up with the two columns of B that we found earlier. Okay? And this, of course, is the inverse of A. Now, um, in general, what this looks like is you start off with this matrix, okay, A on one side, then augment on the identity matrix. And you do row operations until you get A in reduced echelon form. And what you're aiming for is to make it look like the identity matrix. And um, like I said, that may or may not be possible depending on A. If it is, then you'll end up with the identity matrix here, 
and uh, the inverse of A on the right. right. So that's what you're aiming for. And just while we're here looking at this, notice that we could go backwards because we know that all these row operations are reversible. We could go backwards and look what happens. We, we start off with A inverse with the identity tacked on and we get back here and we can make A inverse look like the identity matrix. And so uh, with A over here, so that tells you that if you wanted to take the inverse of A inverse, then you just get the original matrix A back. So the inverse of A inverse is just A. Okay, so what happens if A is not invertible? Um, in this case, uh, it's not row equivalent to the identity. So here's the example we had before where the second column is a multiple of the first. Tack on the identity matrix. Um, do one row operation here and you get to this point and you say, oh, A is not row equivalent to the identity matrix and hence I can't get it in this form where I've got the identity and then A inverse. That tells you that the, that the matrix A does not have an inverse. Okay, So if you can't get A to look like the identity matrix by doing row operations, then A is not invertible or A inverse does not exist. All right, uh, now this method works no matter what size your matrix is, so I scaled it up for a 3 by 3. Okay, start off with this matrix A and uh, tack on the 3 by 3 identity matrix and go through some row operations. A um, lot of uh, arithmetic here. And if you look at the last matrix I have here, look, uh, the first three columns look like the identity matrix. And so sitting over here would be the inverse of A. All right. So this, these last three columns will be the inverse of my matrix A. Um, if you know A inverse, then solving AX equals B is trivial, all right? Because our whole focus in this course is uh, solving AX equals B, solving systems of equations. And so if you know A inverse, then um, it turns out that uh, it's uh, super simple to solve a system of equations involving A. Um, and basically, here's the rationale. Um, start off with AX equals B, um, and you know A inverse exists, then that means you can multiply both sides of your system by A inverse. So I do that. And the reason to do that is because if you look over here, Remember, we can uh, reassociate the parentheses, and so we can end up with A inverse times A together. And the advantage of that is that that equals the identity matrix. So we end up with just the identity matrix times X, and anything times the identity matrix is just that anything. So I times X is X. So X is simply A inverse B. So if you know A inverse, then you don't need to do row operations. You don't need to do any of that stuff. Just multiply A inverse times B, and you have the solution to your system. Okay, clearly that's going to save you a lot of work if you have A inverse. So if I have this matrix A and this vector B, and I want to solve AX equals B, if I don't know A inverse, then i got to go through, you know, set up my augmented matrix, do all these row operations, and I end up here with my solution for negative 7, negative 16. Okay, but if I know A inverse... Okay, so I know A inverse. So here's A, here's B, and I know A inverse. Then to solve AX equals B, as I said, just multiply A inverse times B, and here's your solution. All right, so back, went through all this work to get 4, negative 7, negative 16. Here, if you know A inverse, all you do is simple uh, multiply matrix times a vector, and you have the solution. Now, of course, the downside is that most of the time you don't have A inverse. And uh, to get A inverse, um, well, you saw what uh, work is required in that. More work than simply uh, going back and through uh, to do this. Because to find A inverse for a 3 by 3, we had to solve, uh, let's go back, right? We had to solve uh, three systems of equations. Um, just to solve this system, you need to solve one system of equations. 
Um, but uh, if you know a, a inverse, then solving the system is trivial. Okay, um, let's see. Your book lists some properties of matrix inverses. This one we've already talked about. If you take the inverse of A inverse, you get A back. Um, if you have the inverse of a product, so AB quantity inverse, that is uh, the uh, product of the inverses, but in reverse order. So B inverse times A inverse instead of A inverse times B inverse. And uh, if you take the inverse of a transpose of a matrix, that's uh, equivalent to uh, transposing the inverse.